Lane, uh, we know not, always know that. Um, if you're in the same institution, if you're a close collaborator of someone, uh, it's, it's really difficult to review a collaborator's work negatively. <laughs> um, um, or if you've been in a fight with someone. So occasionally, um, actually authors will contact us and say, please don't be so-and-so as a peer reviewer <laughs> because we've been in a fight. <laughs> Now, that could be the kind of fight that we were told about at UC San Diego, where in the previous institution you got into a personal fight with someone, or it could be a professional fight. Um, an example of that would be uh, Hockney was working with this guy in Arizona, who was the guy, um, who was convinced that Renaissance artists used a particular kind of optical equipment. And it got it, you know, that got into a very heated fight. Um, and we, I, the guy in Arizona submitted an article, and I got an email from someone at Stanford saying, if you dare publish this article, I, I'm, I'm going to really make trouble. Right? Well, these two people were in an in, in intellectual squabble. Um, I didn't know about it. I, I, I could have picked a peer reviewer that had somehow gotten into an intellectual squabble with someone. Um, Right now, I'm in the middle of a squabble that got solved uh, two days ago. Um, we got an article from someone. I got an email from someone saying, if you publish that article, I'm going to sue you. And it turned out the author had also submitted to IEEE, and the person had contacted IEEE and said, if you publish that article, I'm going to sue you. There was a dispute on collaborative work where someone felt someone else was stealing the other person's work <laughs> without contributing directly. Um, uh, so that's clearly a conflict of interest. I mean, clearly there are situations which I cannot know about when the article comes in. And so to some extent, when you submit an article uh, and you, you, know, you may be in the middle of a, a, a very big intellectual argument, it's helpful to let the editor know uh, that so and so is your, you know, is trying to sink you, and please don't use them as a peer reviewer. Um, I had another case in Australia of this, this exact same kind, which was really delicate. The PhD advisor and the student came to blows. The student tried to publish the work without the PhD advisor on the paper. I got an email from the advisor saying, hold on a second. Now, I worked with this person for three years. It was collective work. She used my data in her work. She's now publishing a paper without me. That is not proper. And so uh, it got really, really heated. Um, and so um, we, you know, I, I should have a, a degree in, in therapy or something. <laughs> I mean, you know, it, 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 it got emotional enough because the person who was up for uh, trying to get hired for someone, she needed to get this article published so that the CD had this article in it. Uh, so her, uh, her, the timing was important, you know, uh, from her point of view that, that this article was being published. Um, I, I actually ended up on the phone with a student um, because I, you know, I couldn't figure out what was going on. Um, and, uh, and it, it took about two and a half weeks, and then they, what was worse is there were several other co-authors on the paper, and they didn't know about the squabble between the PhD advisor and the student. Um, um, with the article is being published with the PhD advisor as one of the co-authors, and they, um, so, uh, um, so I, I just wanted to, to tell you a little bit of what happens on the inside of the system. <laughs> Now, typically, uh, I'll work with Nick and we'll assign, and it varies. The minimum is three peer reviewers. Um, sometimes we go up to five peer reviewers. Uh, not all journals do that. The reason I have to do that is many of you are working in these hybrid practices where there may be a technical component to your work where I need a technical peer reviewer to, to look at the claims you're making about the originality. But some of it may be aesthetic or artistic, and then I need a, a, a humanities reviewer. And so 
uh, in an interdisciplinary uh, field, um, you, you somehow need the different ex expertise to look at something. Um, you know, and, and typically what will happen is, and every PhD student writes articles that way, I'm the first person that did something. Well, immediately the peer reviewer will say no. Someone did it in 1982, they didn't use the same technology as you, but conceptually it's exactly the same. Uh, it's, you know, that's very specialized knowledge. Uh, it's not general knowledge that the peer review will have. Um, one of the things that, as part of Cognovo, I'm happy to do if any of you in, are, are interested in, in doing peer reviewing, I'm happy to add you to, to the peer review database. Uh, and I've been doing that with some of my students. And then occasionally, I might just send you an article to peer review. I'll know that you're not an experienced peer reviewer, and so I'll peer review your peer review. <laughs> but actually, some of my PhD students have done amazingly good peer reviews. So if any of you are interested in being on the inside of, of this kind of a system, I'm, I'm happy to, to, to include you. Um, we normally give the peer review, we, we try to make a decision on every manuscript within six weeks. <coughs> it's really difficult. Peer reviewers are really busy. Uh, to do a serious peer review is going to take, pick a number, between an hour and the hours of your time if you're really going to be thorough about it. Um, occasionally I get peer reviews submitted where the person you know, obviously read the article once and said this is bullshit, don't publish it. <laughs> so I don't use that peer reviewer again. Um, some of the peer reviews are so substantial um, that, let me tell you, it's, it's really interesting, and uh, I'll go on to that in a minute. We use what's called single-blind peer reviewing. Um, there are two kinds of peer reviewing, single-blind and double-blind, and actually there's now open uh, peer reviewing um, online. Uh, single-blind is the reviewer knows who the author is, but the author doesn't know who the reviewer is. Double-blind is where neither the author nor the reviewer know who each other are. <laughs> and some journals use double-blind peer reviewing, so you'll get an article, the name of the author has been taken off, and the address. Now, the idea in double-blind is you don't want to be influenced that, well, this person's at MIT, their work must be good. <laughs> and let me tell you, it's really difficult when you get an article from uh, someone at MIT, in inevitably, your judgment is colored by the, yeah, this person must be really good because they're at MIT. Well, there's a lot of MIT stuff that's not very good. <laughs> so double blind reviewing is enough. one attempt to, to counteract some of the sociological um, problems. Um, um, we use single blind, but we allow the peer reviewer to say, I'm willing to be identified to the author. And so occasionally, uh, our peer reviewers will review, peer review the article and, and click the box at the end and say, I'm being willing, willing to, to be known to the author. And then the author and the, and the peer review actually can enter in, in dialogue. Normally, we don't do that, uh, because otherwise we'd be handling disputes every, every two minutes. Um, so we try and make a decision with six, within six weeks. It's, it's difficult. Uh, different journals do it in a different way. I have a friend right now who's um, in Dallas, submitted an article to Science Magazine in September. Where are we now? May. Um, he went through one cycle of peer reviewing and took until February. They rejected the article but would consider a resubmitted article. So then he resubmitted the article responding to the peer reviewers. And then he's got another set of peer reviewers and he's rewriting the articles for us again. My guess is it will take him a year to get through the peer review process. Now, it turns out he's making big claims. <laughs> and so the peer reviewers are being a little bit challenging. Um, we try to make a decision within six weeks. We don't always succeed. Um, once all the peer reviews have come in, uh, Nick, who's the cool naming editor, looks at the peer reviews and if all the peer reviews say, this is a fantastic article, publish it. Actually, the peer review has three options. Publish as is, publish if revised, or reject. If it's three yes, publish as is, 
it just sails into our publishing stream. Um, uh, it, it goes up on MIT Press in what's called Just Accepted. So we normally get it up within a few weeks after that peer review. So you know, the first is you can publish something in our journal is six weeks for peer review, six weeks for the Just Accepted pro process, so two to three months, and that's pretty quick. Um, there are other publications out there that keep them even quicker these days. Um, some of the, the new journals. Um, um, if we get conflicting peer reviews, then that's my weekend reading. <laughs> so typically, um, you know, if we have five peer reviewers or three, often two will say this. One will say this is amazing publishing. Publish it. One will say, well. This is fine, but this section isn't clear. And the other one itself will say, this work's been done six times before. It's not worth publishing at all. So I then, I then got to go read the Goddamn article again, read the three peer reviews, and make my own judgment. Um, and so every weekend, you know, that's what an editor is doing, is trying to figure out and you know, say, no, I make mistakes. The good news is if you submit an article to a peer review journal, at least five people are going to read it. End to end. <laughs> Which, if you know your citation numbers, uh, most of my public, public publications have never been cited by anybody. <laughs> um, so you, you get you know you get several really intelligent readers reading what you're doing, um, and so in the best of cases, it can be a constructive process. Um, in the worst of cases, uh, errors are made, and there's a lot of discussion online. Uh, these days about the, the peer reviewing system, like any system, um, has, has problems. Um, there's a lot of stuff getting through the scientific literature that turns out to be fabricated. Um, and typically the way people find that is where suddenly you, you Google the image and you find the image actually came from some other paper that was unrelated. <laughs> So it's actually fairly easy. Or you can use Turnitin or some of these plagiarism um, software packages these days, and pretty quickly you find out that the section of the paper, and I occasionally do that, and I object to self plagiarism. Um, so occasionally what someone will do will submit an article, and like half of it is extracted from a previous article they published, and they put it into the new article. Well, I did that a couple of times because it was sort of a description of the experiment, a description of the software, it's kind of standard stuff. Um, but, but it gets very difficult if, if three quarters of the article you've already published somewhere else and then you did a new introduction and a new conclusion or something. So be careful about self-plagiarism. Uh, now sometimes there are very good reasons you're going to cut and paste a whole paragraph from somewhere else. <laughs> um, but if it's someone else's paragraph, <laughs> uh, then, you know, then that gets pretty tricky. Uh, and occasionally I run into a little bit of, of that in things that are submitted to you know, I'm just so much pressure to publish that uh, I don't think I've ever even caught anybody using Wikipedia and cutting and pasting the Leonardo submission. But uh, uh, some of kind of things where you find a really good website and it, summarizes the history of scientific publishing from Michael Punk, and we just take those two paragraphs and uh, sort of them. Um, so fraud gets through uh, the peer reviewing sometimes. Um, there's a, sometimes it's very difficult to figure out from what the person puts in a paper whether what they say is really verified in some way. You know, sometimes without having the data itself, it's fit, it's hard, you know, just from the article, it's hard to know exactly you know, what the person, you might, the peer review might want to reanalyze the data with a different algorithm or something and see if it's statistically uh, as strong as the person says. Um, data, sometimes without the software, it's, it's difficult to know what someone did. Um, so what a lot of publications now do, and, and there are new publications being developed, where you actually publish the text with the software and the data. So you can actually publish a whole collection of material 
which allows then the reader or the peer reviewer actually to replicate the experiment uh, or check uh, check the work in some way. Um, so uh, it, 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 depend, it depends on the field. Um, now, peer reviewing less stuff through that turns out not to be very good. Um, and you know, we've published 15,000 articles or something over the history of our publication. Um, some fraction of those were um, people desperate to get something published quickly at a low cost, and probably it wasn't worth publishing. Uh, there's a, there's a, the publish or perish pressure is, is very high in certain research communities. Um, Really weird stuff has trouble getting published. Um, and the, the good news is we tend to track that stuff. Um, so you know, people don't look at a university that make a scientific discovery. Uh, often if you go to a regular scientific journal, they'll say, well, now this, they, they did it in their fiction like in 1540. <laughs> this can't be real science. Uh, so uh, there, there are real fundamental problems inside the, the peer review system. Um, I'm going to show you a, just a, a, a visualization. But any questions about, there are other kind of publishing systems, but Michael has to talk about this, so. Yeah, go ahead. And you mentioned about checking the work that you've done before. Is there any method to do that? Is there something that people are, what's the Okay, so, you know, when I, when normally, what every PhD student will normally do is a literature survey as part of uh, the work they're doing. Um, sometimes it's quite hard to find that, and it's easier these days uh, because of the, the online databases. Um, depending on the work you're doing, sometimes the, the patent database is quite interesting uh, to, to look at patents filed. Uh, if, you, if you happen to be in that area, which may not have you know, the patent may not have been granted, but it was filed. Um, Sometimes it's sometimes it's quite difficult to separate the conceptual part of what you're doing from the execution. Right? So sometimes um, um, you may even think you've you've done something amazing for the first time, but conceptually someone has already opened up that territory, maybe less elegantly or, or less. <coughs> And so but then the question is, does that prior uh, really um, make your work less interesting or not? Uh, so some of that becomes, but certainly I, I would use um, um, Google Scholar and all these other systems to follow the people that are working in the field. So you sometimes conference publications, you will not know that someone four months ago published something. Um, and so using those aware services is, is a good way to stay. Um, sometimes, <coughs> yeah, it, uh, but, but certainly um, as, as you define your PhD topic, really using the online tools to keep aware of what people are doing at the moment. Um, because there's no, nothing worse than submitting something to the publication and, and finding out that someone published a very similar kind of thing uh, six months ago in the Indian Journal or something like that. Sometimes the comments are not really clear what, what they exactly mean. And uh, in that case, do you think a Facebook kind of system where they can comment and then we can respond and the authors can respond? And well, at, well so, and so there are some new journals that actually do totally open peer review, where you submit the article and the peer review posts their reviewer and then you can respond publicly to the peer reviewer. I don't, you know, that's, that's an experiment that those journals are using. Um, occasionally, um, We'll get an author that comes back and says, we don't understand what the reviewer meant by this, and then we'll, we'll actually do an, an exchange. Um, the, I think the, pro the, the, the problem is how to, 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 to not. I mean, the peer review is to give an opinion, uh, right? It's not to do to change the work that the person did. <laughs> and so it, you know, sometimes, and it gets, it gets difficult. In the case of my colleague, um, the peer reviewer said, well, you should really use this software tool to analyze your data, not that one. Well, I 
So my colleague went and reanalyzed their data using this other tool and confirmed they got the same result. And so that's going a little bit further than, than most peer review. Um, and it's true that when I look at the peer reviews that we get and we send to authors, there's a whole range um, of how helpful those are and how specific. You know, sometimes when it says, well, I just don't understand what the person's talking about, well, <laughs> pretty hard. Sometimes it's, you know, there are some key citations that are missing, there's some pretty key prior work. How much longer do I have? Uh, if Nicola has time, thank you. Okay, I, yeah. I would like to show yeah, yeah, this, 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 uh, this uh, visual. I'm not standing to chase you. I have yeah, to no, no. <laughs> uh, any, any other questions? Oh, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. <clears throat> yeah, I was wondering um, how far editorial policies actually influence the way researchers are doing research. Because, um, I mean, nowadays everybody knows the phrase publish or perish. So basically, in order to become a professional, you have to publish in high quality journals. And there are certain criteria like reporting p values, which are um, like the, the the standard, the golden standard for publications, and so researchers try to uh, set, satisfy these criteria. They try to look for confirmation of hypothesis. They don't try to falsify their hypothesis because no one publishes negative results, for example. And also replication. You were talking about duplication or replication. I think the number of replications is very small, so we get the file draw effect from a statistical point of view. It's very dangerous because you have very high rates of false positives, and I wonder if you could comment on that, or what's so, your personal so, take on that? So, so, I mean, that clearly is a huge problem in some fields, and there's been a huge amount of writing recently in the medical field, where um, also it's expensive to replicate the experiment, but 95% uh, or even higher, maybe, have definitely been replicated, and so you get claims in the open peer-reviewed literature that you say, well, it's been peer reviewed but, you know, and judged, but, but in fact, it turns out there's a fundamental error in, in the methodology. So, so that, that's a real problem. Um, I guess I'm in the camp that, that says, you know, a lot of these problems are just the growth of the, of the whole thing. And so the fraud, the lack of replication, and all these things. Uh, and so what we're beginning to see actually is funding agencies funding replication research. <laughs> which is sort of a, 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 new, a new idea because normally funding agencies hate <laughs> to fund you checking someone else and redoing it. Um, obviously with Cold Fusion there was a, uh, there was a lot of that when, when that was there. So I think, the, but the other part of your question, I think it, 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 it's a real problem because the, the institutional time constant of publications is sometimes misfitting the rate of scientific advance. And so rapidly emerging new areas sometimes get blocked uh, in the very high peer-reviewed uh, citation industry uh, journals, right? Um, and so uh, those journals react, but sometimes it takes them 15 or 20 years. So you take a few like bioinformatics or something, you know, at the beginning, it was very hard to get that stuff published in the, in the, in the high citation journals. Now, new journals dedicated to those areas that have appeared. Um, you know, an example of that is um, we started this section in Leonardo on Earth's humanities and complex networks. Let me tell you, if you were a humanities researcher using complex networks and visualization to analyze medieval manuscripts, you were going to have a hell of a time with that published in a regular humanities journal. And so we kind of provided a safe place for, for certain scholars to publish. Now it was not, you know, it was not highly cited maybe in in our history, <laughs> but at least it was a reputable journal. So it, it is I mean, it is a social system, and I'll show a little bit of that. And um, you know, right now um, we're setting up a new journal with Tsinghua University in China, and the Chinese scientists feel that the Western scientific establishment is keeping them out of the literature, right? That, so if you're a first-rate Chinese scholar, you cannot get published in science or nature or that. So China is studying a whole number of new publications because they feel there's a sociological problem 
Uh, same with Indian scientists. I mean, I know people who feel that if you, you know you cannot get published in the Western dominated scientific publishing establishment, if you come from some institute in China, in India, which the peer reviewers have never heard about. So there are uh, the real problems I think about uh, that, that exist, and um, and so we're going to start this new Chinese English journal with Tsinghua, and part of their argument is. You know, we're not being taken seriously by the journals we think should be taken seriously. Mass. You, know, you refer to a whole bunch of other problems there. Right? And, and there's a very interesting um, you know, debate these days of people analyzing how peer reviewing functions or malfunctions. Um, and one of the things I'm trying to do in, um, in, in Dallas is I'm calling it knowledge curation. Um, one of the things I hate in peer reviewing is, is when I, and this weekend I'm going to do it again, I got five conflicting peer reviews and I have to make a yes no decision. Right? Well, maybe I'd like to make a maybe decision and put it online <laughs> and publish it. Um, and in fact, uh, some communities have done that. Right? So uh, in astrophysics, you put your article on a preprint server before peer review. Right? And so there are a number of communities that have set up totally valid preprint servers where you submit things before peer review, <coughs> and then it goes into the peer reviewing system and might or might not get published. Well, the nice thing is that stuff is available online. It may sink without a trace <laughs> because it turned out to be nonsense, but at least uh, you, you get you get the visibility. And so the, these preprint um, systems are, are quite a good good way of doing that. And I think we're going to see more and more of that. Um, uh -huh. Yeah. Do you want to show it? Yeah. <laughs> um, so what, what I uh, hopefully the internet will allow me to do this. Um, so. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So what do I do that? So. <coughs> Um, because we're uh, because we're uh, Thank <laughs> you. 
He started the citation analysis in 1974, and all, this is the journal Leonardo and the other journals that it cites. And what you're going to see over time is how the journals that people in Leonardo cite evolve. We're up to 77, Science Magazine, the American Journal of Psychology, the Journal of the American Medical Association. Um, Photomicrography, I don't know what book would be is, Impact Science, we're up to 79, Daedalus, Communication. So what was kind of interesting to me just looking at this is you kind of think of a, a journal as a static thing, but it's actually rapidly, we're up to 1980. Dunn Studies appears as a cited journal because we started publishing in that area. Sort of interesting to me sitting on the you know on the inside node of this network diagram is in fact how you know, intellectual communities creative communities actually move around uh, in the publishing landscape um, and you can sort of see how certain topics get really hot at a certain time and so certain interdisciplinary connections get made um, <laughs> <laughs> He's done this for a number of different journals, and you, you can see how it's kind of an evolving network of these journals that interact more with each other or not at all with each other. Um, <laughs> yeah. uh, well, he probably, there's a caption there that will explain what, what he's talking about there. Actually, let me show that. So that was the, I think that was the journal's slide plot. Anyway, you get the idea. He's done it both incoming citations, outgoing citations. So, so the main thing is, uh, you know, there's this moving network of journals and conferences out there. Um, they're all, you know, groups of people that are paying more or less attention to something. And so, you know, I think each of one of, of you needs to be strategic. Uh, about where you go publish now, maybe you'll publish somewhere in a different journal later, um, and if you want to get uh, the different kinds of attention. Anyway, so I'm going to stop there. Um, I spent a lot of time looking at these videos. So. Yeah, now I want to ask you, uh, we're going to hand over to Nicola now. Um, but what your, what's your view on the fact that it's the most popular? I, I, I'm in favor. <laughs> um, I, I think we just need a plethora of these different um, mechanisms. Um, um, I think that the, we're also going to develop better methods than citations to figure out the impact of things. I think yeah. you know, there's a whole new area of the research there. Um, one of the things I'm really interested in, and maybe over the three years of Pognovo, we can try some things on. Um, there's a phenomenon called the gray literature out there right now, um, which is a lot of literature that turns out to have a lot of impact, but it's not in peer-reviewed journals, not presented at conferences. Uh, and so there are all these other uh, sources of documentation that are, that are getting growing importance. Some of that is process documentation, which is quite interesting, I think. Um, so some collaborations actually in an ongoing way, publish work and update it as it gets involved, and so that the publication is not a static object, but something that maybe evolves over five years. Um, 
so it, it, I'm, I'm sort of interested in, in process documentation. Um, one of the things that we're going to start uh, probably in the fall is I have some students working on an internet radio station, uh, which will be for very focused uh, research topic areas. And so it would be the kind of, you know, you could take Cognovo and we could do podcasts on what someone's working on at the moment and, and, and really just, just do that kind of process um, documentation. And so I'm really interested in sort of looking at this network model of, of, of documentation and also including the gray literature somehow in that and creating uh, gray literature. 